Hello and welcome to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson. If this is your first time joining us, we want to welcome you. It's great to have you with us today. The Rising Generation exists to inspire and equip Christian leaders from all walks of life, from all around the world, to fulfill their God-given potential. By hearing these interviews with established, internationally recognized leaders, we hope you'll be inspired to connect the dots between where you are now and where it is God has called you to be. Now, to receive notifications about future episodes, simply subscribe to our podcast show by either on iTunes, if you're on Apple, or on Stitcher, the Stitcher app, if you're on Android. You can find out how to do that just by going to our webpage at www.errolawson.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, share it with your loved ones. Hopefully, they will also benefit from the content. Guys, thanks for listening. Before we go into today's show, here's some news for you. Hey guys, how you doing? It's Errol here. Hope you're doing great today. Um, before we go into our interview today, I want to give you just a bit of a heads up on our Rising Generation campaign that started on the 1st of October. Now, if you're not aware already, um, we've been doing these interviews now. We've taken some of the nuggets from the, from the interviews and put them into a fantastic book, a resource called The Rising Generation, which is an amazing resource for emerging leaders, established leaders that will help you to step into your biggest challenges and become the leader that God has designed you to be. Now, the way the campaign works is this. Um, our goal is to get 1,000 pre-orders of the book between now and the end of October, and all the profits from the campaign are going to go towards our work in Africa, in Ghana. We're working with young people and giving them leadership training and soft skills training and even more. And and so for the last 15 years, I've been working as a leadership coach, a consultant, working in education and in business. You can check out my website for more information. Uh, I'm a John Maxwell trained coach, speaker and trainer. My appeal to you today is this. Uh, I want to offer my services to you, to your church, to your business, to your organization, to you as an individual in return for your support for this campaign. Let me give you an example of some of the packages that I'm offering to you. If you were to pre-order 150 copies of the Rising Generation book for your team, for your organization, for your church, or for your business, in return, I would offer you firstly a 90-minute live keynote address on a leadership topic of your choice, along with a Q&A for your organization or team. I'd also offer you a one-day leadership workshop for your team or organization, again, on a leadership topic of your choice. And also, in addition to that, give you a free half-day one-to-one or group coaching session, again, for yourself as a leader or for your core team or for your wider team on a leadership topic of your choice, all in return for your contribution, um, which is a $5,000 contribution. You're going to get $8,900 worth of value for your investment, and all the profit goes to the work in Ghana. How awesome is that? And there's a similar package. There's so many offers I've got. Another option is the $1,500 package, which for, for your $1,500 contribution, you'll get 20 copies of the book for your team or organization. And also a one-day leadership workshop with myself, again, for your team, your organization. I'll come in and train your team on a leadership topic of your choice. How amazing is that? So, so, so much value. And there are many more offers in line with your budget, what you're able to invest. I want to reach out to you guys. Go and check out the website to make this campaign a success. We really, really need your support. I'm banking on you. So please share this with your friends and help us to spread the word. We appreciate you. God bless you. Enjoy today's episode. And welcome again to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson. And my very special guest today is Lord Michael John Hastings. He's the Baron of Hastings. Baron Hastings Royal of Scarisbrick, CBE. He's KPMG's International Global Head of Corporate Citizenship and much, much more. Um, Lord Hastings. Thank good you. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Great to have you with us on the podcast this morning, sir. Um, before we begin, uh, please fill in any gaps in your bio right there. Give us a bit more of a glimpse of what you're up to right now. A lot of my life is um, about traveling the world, and uh, I travel extensively each month, uh, not, not for the fun of it, although it's not a bad experience. I travel to visit the countries where KPMG, the business I work for, 
has substantial offices and big networks of people. We've got 180,000 people around the world in 165 countries. And very often I'm asked to come and meet with our leading clients in each country. I'm asked to pioneer initiatives that are going to positively change the environment or the natural world or going to impact the community. I'm asked to highlight uh, the values of the business and the fabric of the business. And are very often asked to join in public discussion on major issues. So one of the trips coming up for me in a couple of weeks' time, which I'm I'm looking forward to the challenge of, is with the World Economic Forum. It's a group meeting in Dubai and where we're going to focus on the complicated issue of migration flows across the Mediterranean, the migration flows across from Syria into Turkey, into Europe, the tragedy of the refugee crisis that is uh, afflicting European people and governments, but more importantly is the story of a tragedy of millions of poor and desperate people looking for life beyond their own establishment and, and the basics of where they've been. So I get to engage in the policy changes the world needs to see, and I also get to engage in driving the basics of how a business thrives. I mean, a fundamental pillar of how KPMG sees itself uh, is that we're driven by our values. And those values include making sure that we're trusted publicly and we build a positive legacy in every community. So that's my responsibility of the business. That's why I travel a lot and I enjoy it enormously. Uh, I get the opportunity to see great initiatives driven from beginning to end and that gives me enormous accomplishment that's great it's great and uh, i know that you've been you've been someone that's personally inspired me over the last few years um seeing your example as a christian leader um and just seeing you gen genuinely um just serving the kingdom of god and and of course the wider world and i know uh, many of the leaders are young people especially looking to you and thinking wow like how would somebody um be positioned for such kind of influence, in a sense, um, as a Christian. Can you tell us a bit about your story and how it began for you and how you transitioned into what it is that you're doing right now? Well, I think the, uh, let me give you the fundamental lesson first, and then, mm -hmm. I'll, and then I'll come back to the story. Mm -hmm. I think the fundamental lesson, um, I, I've, I did a degree degree in theology so you know i love that uh, it was a great experience to understand more of scripture but also to understand more of the context of biblical theology and history mm -hmm. and here i am working for one of the world's four big accounting firms uh, and so many people say to me uh, what's the connection between theology and accountancy or theology and tax advice or theology and business strategy and I say to them, the connection is about the excellence of work and commitment and determination and diligence that you show irrespective of whatever your educational or career or work background is. Uh, one of the events I'll be going to shortly in the United States is to be addressed by the chief executive of Walmart, a wonderful man called Doug McMillan. And Walmart is the world's largest corporation turning over around about $700 billion every single year. It's larger than many countries in the world are. And Walmart's chief executive, Doug McMillan, started off literally as the, the poster boy in the, in the post room. Mm. And he's been there for a generation of service excellence and ends up from literally the post room to the chief executive's chair, not because he gained qualifications, or he went to business school because he was proficient and competent and passionate and purposeful. So that's the lesson. And mm. after after going to theological in London, I then taught for a number of years in a school, which I loved dearly. The, the, the ability to spend time experiences of young boys and girls and to give them an insight into why, in my case, religious studies was an important discipline. From that, got whisked into working for Margaret Thatcher's government in Number 10 Downing Street and worked on urban renewal strategy after the 1985 riot, which followed the 1981 riots and the famous Brixton Moss side. 
and Hansworth and those kind of urban riots which have been so turbulent and I was given the joy of helping fix some of the outcomes and then went into television and did um, research and then got a live television uh, slot every morning on TVAM for wow. those who remember it and mm -hmm. then after that was uh, chief political correspondent at GMTV and then the BBC pulled me in and did live television and then uh, after a year of live television the BBC asked me to take over the public affairs division and head the BBC's relationships with government to win key arguments around the future of the BBC right back there in the mid-1990s uh, into the 2000s. And then KPMG rang up and here I am. So wow. the journey has been a whole series of ins and outs all over the place. You know, somebody said at 21, what was going to be your career? career trajectory and i would say very simply is to follow when the phone calls come mm -hmm. and that's how it's been so i just follow when the phone calls come it's great it's great and then um, along that journey was there i'm sure there've been many of these were um turning points significant maybe revelations or epiphanies that you had maybe you're heading in one direction in your journey and something happened and caused you to go in a, in a completely different direction can you tell us one of those stories Oh, I think probably the most dramatic was the all of a sudden phone call uh, in 19, um, 1986 that I will never forget that phone call from someone who was working inside 10 Downing Street. Uh, those are the days uh, you might, you're far too young, Errol, to remember, but those were the days when we didn't have mobile phones and, um, you know, phones were attached to walls. And so, You'd sit at a desk and the phone would ring and you, that was it. You couldn't go anywhere with it. Uh, and I remember the phone call that morning and it was from uh, somebody I'd only met once or twice, six years before, a man called Hartley. And he rang up and said uh, he was calling me from Downing Street. And I, I laughed and I said, I didn't know there was a phone box in Downing Street. <laughs> Thinking, of course, he can't possibly be inside. And he laughed and said, actually, I'm inside. And I laughed and said, what are you doing in there? And then he said he was working for the prime minister. And I said, what on? Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, on urban policy. And I, that, then I really laughed because this guy would never have recognized an inner city if, uh, if he'd had to walk through it. He just, he'd always lived in the celebrated country establishments and the great houses. And, um, but a lovely guy, lovely guy, lovely guy, and a, a man of faith. And he, um, and I said, how can I help you, Hartley? And he said, um, the Prime Minister wants you to come in and help us get our response to the riots of 81 and 85, right? Help us rebuild confidence in the community. Help us to spend money in a way which is going to give people employment and jobs and prospects. And the next day I was in number 10. Wow. Uh, literally, and that was the beginning of a five to six year, nearly five and a half year journey going around the country to great places like Hansworth in Birmingham and <laughs> Moss Side in Manchester and all over the inner cities of London and up into Newcastle and across into Liverpool and you name it, wherever there had been urban disturbances, 81, 85, my task was to build the connections with community organizations, particularly the African Caribbean community organizations, and to build the confidence that government cared deeply about these things. Um, so that was a surprise, you know, that, I mean, it was just a phone call in the morning mm. and my whole life turned around. Wow. Wow. Favor. Are you seriously fired up about growing as a leader in business or church-based ministry? Are you feeling somewhat frustrated about not having realized your full potential in what you've been called to do? Could you do with someone to help you get some extra clarity or to be a sounding board for your plans and ideas? Great athletes have coaches, so do great leaders. The right leadership coach for you will result in an increased sense of clarity, direction, and purpose, dramatically increasing the results you achieve. If you're ready to step up, contact Errol to book a free, no obligation, introductory coaching session and see whether Errol is the right coach for you. Errol takes the lessons learned from his own leadership journey and from his extensive research to help leaders and entrepreneurs to step into their biggest challenges and rise to their next level. Email admin at errollawson.com right now to schedule your call. What's been your biggest challenge so far in your leadership journey? 
Well, I suppose um, if you are a positive, and I am a positive visionary, uh, and I believe in I, I believe in possibilities all the time. Um, never get consumed by other people's cynicism. So if you are a positive visionary with a, a strong forward direction, mm. uh, you know, part of part, I suppose the biggest frustration you experience is watching multitudes of wonderful people just consumed with the emptiness of the everyday. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you see that, if I'm honest, you see that amongst believers, the people who's, who say they're following Jesus, that they are as sometimes as materialistic and possessive of the things that you can hold and the things that glisten mm. as the non-believer is. And sometimes the believers lack more vision. I've been so surprised in this journey of working in a big commercial firm um, as I go around the world and I come across, I come across young Muslims who are doing more to change the communities around them and the world beyond them than I ever find amongst the Christian followers. Uh, when I come across people who, as I did with one man literally last week from one of our competitors' firms, and I turned to him when he was telling about the incredible things that he's been doing over years to raise resources for charities that care for people who are struggling with severe terminal-related illnesses and uh, and caring for them in the weakest points of their lives. And I asked him, are you a man of faith? And he said, no, I have no faith at all. And yet hit this persistence. And then I'll meet with believers and their lives are just about going to church and having a mortgage. And, you know, that really, that really frustrates me. Uh, we should be in the front row of following where Jesus stepped. And he's very clear at defining the characteristics of the acceptable. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was hungry, you provided food. When I needed shelter, you were there with a house. You know, th those are the characteristics he says identify us with him. Mm. Uh, but getting the believing community to be in the front foot of that uh, is, is frustrating. You know, I, I've been a champion of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, these 17 objectives, these targets, which are designed to achieve one critical objective, which is by 2030, we should have seen the end of extreme poverty in our world. It can't be acceptable mm. that while people sit here listening to a podcast on a piece of what's in world terms expensive equipment, but in our terms relatively cheap, and there are still nearly a billion people who don't have more than a dollar a day to gather food from and people who don't have toilets and they don't have water and they don't have electricity and they don't have schools and there are still multitudes of children who so, die so what's the lesson what's the lesson for those who are listening right now maybe they are could be established or emerging leaders and they're listening what's the lesson to them you think from that story well the lesson is this um you know, a year after the business world and the NGO world, government world agreed that these 17 targets were the targets to aim at, a year after I got invited to a church gathering in the House of Commons uh, with a number of Christian organizations who wanted to ask the question, should they support the Sustainable Development Goals? And I, I went along to the meeting and I spoke to them, but I said to them, you know what gets me is we're a year on from when the rest of the world has started and you're only asking the question now, should you support them? The lesson is, if these are the defining things that Jesus said matter to him in accepting us and being alongside us by grace, then we ought to be running ahead with our desires for justice meeting the needs of the poor, for giving people work that is going to set them free mm. and creating the fair world. And I, I want to believe in, I want to believe in a, a community of those who follow Christ, mm. who are passionate enough about where the pain in the world is, that they don't wait for their churches to give them the marching order, but they grab the mantle of the call and they get out there and do it. And whether it is that they join Tear Fund or they join Christian Aid or they join World Vision or they 
join any of the other agencies or UNICEF or Oxfam or whoever it happens to be, or it, within wherever they are, they take that initiative, which will make a profound, long-lasting difference. But they don't sit there apathetically saying, I'm just praying about it and waiting on God. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And um, at this stage in your journey now, at the point you're at, how do you now define success? What does success look like to you? Um, I don't define success materially. I've got that. I don't need it. So I don't define it that way. Um, I define success as the opportunity to give light and hope where I am. Uh, for me, part of the journey of the last few years has been to draw a number of others alongside. It's always take others with me. Uh, when I got the chance to be somewhere exhilarating, exciting, interesting, I take others with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to open doors because I have so many doors that open to me by the fact of being in Parliament, by the fact of being in a major business, by the fact of being on the foundation board of Vodafone, by the fact of being a vice president of UNICEF, by the fact of being the Chancellor of Regents University in London. I have so many doors that open to me all over the UK, all over the world, but I always take others in. And I feel well, it's important to leave a very significant lasting legacy invested in their lives uh, to give them vision uh, beyond the everyday. And, you know, yes, the frustration lies in watching people sometimes you give vision to who throw it to the floor. But the thrill lies in giving vision who grab it and go faster. And, I, and you know, we, we, I suppose if we look at the lives of the 12 men that Jesus, the first 12 men that Jesus had around him, we know that not, not many of those names survived into the annals of history mm -hmm. uh, because some of them just did nothing with the opportunity. Mm. Wow. That's the way it is, that's okay. Wow. We have to accept it, but we want, we want to see every man, every woman grab the chance they have. That's great. That's my that's challenge. That's great. And John Maxwell said that uh, the secrets to success are hidden in your daily routine. Um, typically speaking, what do the first 90 minutes of your day look like? <laughs> the first 90 minutes of my day, um, I'm usually up around 5, 5, probably no later. Um, I talk to the dog, I, have, uh, I make coffee, I have some water, I sit down and I read from scripture. And that's very important. I combine uh, looking through the BBC News website to make sure I'm fully aware of any major events that might have happened overnight. And I'm not either thinking or praying naively. Um, and then I sit and I, I reflect, uh, working through passages in the Bible and thinking about big issues in the world. And this morning was a good example of uh, reading a Psalm, uh, Psalm 19, and then reading Time magazine about the future of democracy. And I, I put those two together so i've reflected on scripture and reflected on uh, on god and the call of our life and then i've thought hard about the challenges of the big things coming up in the american elections and the challenges coming up in the future of democratic states around the world and i've got myself ready for a day in which i might be thrown those challenges at any moment from either side and uh, so my, the first 90 minutes of my day are reflective they always are mm, that's great and um, what other key habits have contributed towards your success the key habits? Yeah. Any other key habits that have contributed towards your success? Well, <laughs> there was a wonderful man that I and everyone who was at my school, Scarisbrook Hall School, owe a huge amount to. And this is the wonderful man still alive now called John Sutton Smith. He was uh, led the fellowship of, of uh, young believers, but he also was our head of English. And um, he, I remember him saying, and this is going way back now. So this is 1973. Oh, my word. 19, you weren't even born now. Were no. you? But 19, <laughs> yeah. I remember him saying these very powerful words. He said, uh, the devil lives in the duvet. And that what he meant by that was that the bed fights to keep you in it mm. when God needs you to get up and look out beyond. You need to kind of shake the sleep off yourself, um, grab 
and get into them, take time to be peaceful. You know, our world today is consumed with a meditative, meditative methodology called mindfulness. Mm. And mindfulness, I think, has done a remarkable and wonderful thing. But those of us who are followers of Jesus, we should have been in the lead on mindfulness because to sit and reflect peacefully and mm. to listen to the voice of God, that's a fundamental part of our DNA. But we need every, everybody needs the mental space to be calm. Mm. And John Sutton Smith said, the devil is in the duvet. In other words, get up, boy, mm -hmm. throw it off, get out. So that habit of discipline, I think, is incredibly important. A second yeah. habit is be very aware of the world around you and the world beyond you. Mm -hmm. The kind of crises that hit people, whether it is the tragedies of terrorism or the uncertainties of economy, those things don't need to be horrible surprises. We should have perspective. We need perspective. We need to be intelligent about the world around us. You know, in, in the debates uh, around the UK's place in the European Union, so many people said, but I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to vote because I don't know what the facts are. And I wanted to because the, the detail of facts are available on the BBC website. It's so overwhelming, it would take you a generation to read them. Mm. But people are not pursuing the truth, and the need to pursue the truth, I think, is a very important discipline. And then the mm. third discipline, so the first one is be up, be ready, be aware. The second one is you know, be intelligent about the world around you. And the third discipline is, is <clears throat> make, it, make it the case that at the end of every week, the end of every month there are more people that you've given to than you've taken from hmm. it's great it's great awesome and uh next question for you is, is what is your biggest weakness as a leader uh probably impatience with myself um i get i have to guard against allowing frustration the moment i'm used to quite a bit of momentum mm. uh, pace and in the business world you have to that's the way it is i mean things move uh, and i'm in a big a big professional sharp wide-eyed business and things move and they move fast all the way around the world all the time uh, and not everybody i'm i'm either mentoring or uh, not everybody in every organization i'm involved with can work at that pace and I have to be careful not to outrun them. Mm. And what's your biggest strength? If I had to look at myself, I think, uh, I think it is optimism. Okay. And that optimism convinces me that when you look at a challenge as big as the sustainable development goals, you know, can we see the end of extreme poverty and hunger by 2030, just 14 years away? I say yes to that, not, not oh my word it'll be far too difficult to achieve no it, we have to we have to be optimistic pursuers of opportunity mm. and i'm prepared to strive for it even if at the end of the day you never quite get there but it's being in the ring to have the fight rather than winning mm. that's most important that's good and, and we're almost done now what, what was what was holding you back from going into leadership at the start of your journey if anything at all was holding you back what was holding you back from going in Well, I suppose, um, you know, in, in, in a, a lot of, in Christian terms, leadership is often defined according to positions within a church fabric. Mm. Uh, and, and, and people are quite possessive of those positions. Mm. And my inclination, having, even though I did a degree in, theology i didn't see myself quote unquote being ordained or going into a church position i didn't see that what i did see instead was stepping out into the world beyond um and serving where i could with with skills particularly around communication uh, and using those skills to galvanize interest and commitment for what has always been my long-term purpose which is to serve the poor and to bring prosperity to those who are on the edge of life. And so I suppose it was um, 
if leadership is divine by positions in churches, I wasn't looking for that. I didn't want it. Uh, and therefore, would I be seen as a leader if I took these initiatives over here? I, I didn't mind. and I wasn't interested. What, uh, what's been the journey, I suppose, the lesson of the journey for me so far is leadership comes to you as long as you do the right service. Mm. But don't grab it as a title. That's good. That's good. And, and for so many young leaders, uh, this message from church that the number one job in church is the full-time pastor or the full-time minister and anything, everything else below that, if you're a teacher or a lawyer or whatever have you below that, is, is somehow inferior. As, um, as being communicated, I think, unfortunately, subconsciously, it's been received that way by a lot of young people. And um, people like yourself help us to break out of that, I think, and, and seeing you doing things and, and still flying the flag of, the flag of faith uh, is really, really important, really inspirational. Who have been your most significant mentors on your leadership journey so far? Tell us your top three, just three, three mentors that have um, been significant in your life so far. Three mentors. Um, uh, number one, it, it, this is if I put them in ranking, I suppose, of influence. Um, number one would be <clears throat> Major General Sir John Nelson, mm -hmm. now long dead, a wonderful former British military general who helped to lead the British assault against the Nazis in the war, the Second World War. Now. 1939 to 1945, uh, driving the Germans out from the n north of Africa across the Mediterranean back into Europe. And I met him when he was well retired in his early 60s and spent a wonderful 15 years at his feet, listening and learning on a regular basis. Wow. A man strong, deep, uh, intelligent, but traditional faith. And he taught me so much about the leadership journey. Wow. So him, um, Charles Oxley, the headmaster of Scarisbrook Hall School, where I where I was, <clears throat> quite a remarkable man whose biblical commitment was extreme, and whose pursuit of discipline was profound. And the way he built up that school and the schools that he owned, uh, what it did for me in the framework of nurturing a young faith, and then also moving that faith forward. Past he's long gone, but um, you know the legacy lives in me and everyone else who's had the opportunity to be at Scarisbrook Hall School. And then I suppose the third person would be my dear friend, uh, Anthony Cordell. We've been friends for over 40 years. Uh, as he has passed into his 70s, um, and I am still in my 50s, um, and I remember when we met and I was 18, um, and he just helped me to have this vivid focus on the person of Jesus. Uh, and uh, as he has travelled the continent of Africa with a passion for change in Africa's countries. Uh, that has given me a passion for change in Africa's countries. Um, and as he is engaged, I mean, as he is literally right now in China with some of China's leaders who are seeking to be more um, centered on a world that needs their philanthropy and generosity. So I seek to do likewise. And I, I've always found with Anthony that um, the focus is on who the person of Jesus is not what the establishment or institution is. That's great. That's great. Awesome. And uh, and what's the what's the one thing you're most fired up about right now? Most fired up about most fired up about uh, is this long term goal. You know, it's mm -hmm. easy to get ex exhilarated mm -hmm. by the energy of today. Uh, literally today and then tomorrow's just another day and you think, oh, what happened yesterday? But the long-term goal, 2030, the end of extreme poverty and hunger, the end of crippling and permanent disease on those who can't get clean water, the end of the darkness of no electricity, the end of the filth of no sanitation, the end of the injustice of corrupted police wow. and broken court systems, those things, those things fire me up. Oh. And, and I will be as fired up about them 14 years' time oh. as I am today. Awesome, awesome. And, and lastly, Mike, please, what's, um, what's a book or a resource you'd recommend for a leader or entrepreneur that's listening right now? There's a great book. I just have uh, two-thirds finished. It's a wonderful book by Eric Metaxas called Seven Men. Okay, and it, it has the likes of William Wilberforce, 
in it and Eric Liddell and um, Chuck Colson and a whole series of other people, just seven men whose the nature of whose life purpose, sacrifice, commitment from high office to, as it were, low issues. Um, that's, that's a great book. Awesome. Awesome. And, and how can we find out more about your work, Mike? Where do we go? Is there a website? Are you on social media? How can someone get in touch with you? Social media? <laughs> uh, well, there is, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Lord Hastings. Uh, that's it, really. I don't do any of that other stuff. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not okay. on all that stuff. Far too time consuming and wasteful. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have a professional. <laughs> A professional Twitter page. It's not a personal Twitter page. It's a professional Twitter page, and uh, it tells stories. I don't engage in chit chat on it. Awesome. So that's it. Awesome. That's great, great. To talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time today. Really appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us today on the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast. I pray you've been inspired. You've been lifted. You've been encouraged to take your personal leadership to the next level. We really encourage you guys to just take action, make it happen, do something, start somewhere, go out and change the world in some way, big or small. Guys, if you've enjoyed the podcast today, please share with your friends, share with your loved ones, your colleagues, someone out there you think might benefit from hearing this great content. And uh, if you want some more questions answering, you got a question, email me, errol at errollawson.com. Or if you want a free 30 to 45 minute coaching session with myself around the leadership challenge or issue you're working on in your business, your church, or in your organization, please feel free to email me right away or get your booked in. It's errol at errollawson.com. Thank you again for listening. Go to our iTunes page, check it out, check out the previous episodes, give us a nice review, that'd be awesome. Really appreciate if you could do that for us. We really appreciate you just for being here and listening. Thank you so much. God bless you and we'll see you on the next episode of The Rising Generation.